comment before we, I, you know, while I was sitting there, I, you know, of many years I've been in the, everybody always talks about too many acronyms, particularly with analysts, we always make them up, not as much anymore, but we used to make them up all the time, it was a daily thing. But I was overwhelmed here with the different standards, different issues. I, I don't know if the rest of you had that same impression, but that's one reason we see infrastructure cybersecurity as different. You know, it's not just a lot of people talking about a standard, which is a very good, stand, very good standard, but it's for a certain use case, and it solves that problem. It helps to solve that problem. But these, all of the talks I heard here all kind of mention things that are very unique issues, and they're real serious problems. They have to be addressed, and I don't know how you get your hands around that, let alone the last thing you just said, which is almost down to the device, which is kind of a common issue. But, I mean, all these kind of things, like when Joel was talking about transportation, talking about nuclear, talking about uh, other th poultry farms. <laughs> but anyhow, really, to me, I just want to highlight that point. So with that said, we want to open the floor to questions, but I have some too, but uh, we'll give, we like to give our guests first shot, or as much time as you like. Yes. Yes. First, uh, I'm from Purdue, not the poultry process, just so I'm taking names. Awesome. And the uh, address is about a pound of the three model. That's I'm hilarious. Not part of the three model, but there are three areas that I, I have kind of questions for you. Um, and, and my goal is to run all energy utilities. We're basically running the system now. And that includes electric, clean, still water, domestic water. If, if we put in a three-tier authentication process, the first people to object to it are the people that want to come in remotely to work on our systems. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm just challenged in that we are the customer, as are many of you in the room, that that's an education of the security, the secure access versus the convenience factor. And I, I'm wondering if you're encountering the same thing. Absolutely. The second thing is, I guess I am one of the C level because I establish the budgets and consume about 65% of all of physical facilities budget. Um, legacy items that vendors have, that we have out there can go back 40 years. Updating them is expensive and it was a challenge to educate the very top level that this is infrastructure. <coughs> the building control systems that you have out those, the devices, the panel boards, that's something that when we look at that, it's not just a deferred maintenance, it's a replacement. And I challenge the vendors in here that you keep coming out with new technology, new components, new pieces. And I'm wondering if you guys are experiencing the same thing. And lastly, that new technology, including devices that are back net capable, create havoc within our network if you don't have da uh, governance on your systems if you don't properly port them, if you don't properly uh, uh, restrict the output and address it, and yet we see things come in with BACnet capabilities that have no limitations, and the manufacturers, not just the uh, control systems, want all of that data to come out of our system so they can study and look at that equipment. And yet, we're really only looking at maybe seven points out of 30,000 that they may have on a piece of equipment. <laughs> So I, I, I throw those out because I th they, they help define what we had to set up, and I'm curious as to your responses. Who wants to start? Sure. So a couple comments on that one. Let's start with them. Um, so I worked on meters for a long time, right? And we turned these things based on customer requirements into oscilloscopes on the wall, 1,000 data elements. And basically, the Duke model, at least, today, there's ways that we can make money, but it's based on one value, kilowatt hours. So if you look in the back office, you'll see one field, KWH. At the front, at the edge, a thousand data elements. It's an amazing thing how this happened. You know. We could go into all the details around that. You say remote access. Why, why do they need remote access? This is a tough one. And from a patch management point of view, um, I'm not advocating 
no, nobody likes to see Windows updates run on their machine all the time, right? I'm not advocating that. Uh, Linux is really nice. They do a great job updating stuff. But we have to be able to have a test environment in the back. And you work in a test environment with the flat, fat client software that they provide, and you get the job done. And if you like what you've got, this is kind of risky. It depends on what the device is. It's, if it's a protection relay, if it's one thing. If it's a cap bank controller, I'm not so concerned about it as much, right? So, and I'm sure you have devices like that in your system. The protection relay in our space is like the holy grail device, right? That's the one where you have to really talk about what you're doing. Maybe you need to visit the site. But you test it all in the back, and you develop a patch. You develop a blob that's in some standard that I don't think, our industry doesn't have the standard. You know, it's got a, it's digitally signed, it has a header, it's got the data, and you deliver that through the network down to the edge device, and wherever it lands, it gets verified that it's authenticated, and it came from the mothership, and you believe it, and you apply the patch. We do not have that today. Today we have a bunch of fat client software that wants to directly couple with edge devices. And I, when are we ever going to move forward as an industry? I just don't, I don't get this one. Why don't we tackle that one? So that's my comment on remote access and patching. Okay, you made a couple great points. And first off, Purdue, go Big Ten. I'm an Illinois grad, so. A um, couple things. I really respected your comment on cost versus convenient because probably one of the biggest challenges that I come across as an independent reviewer and recommender, right, companies hire us to come in and tell them what they're doing wrong, is oftentimes we go to great lengths to put in security measures that the IT organizations circumvent right out of the gate. For instance, they'll create this massive management infrastructure. So when you start to say, why in the world are you doing that? In general, you typically should manage the security from the highest security zone in, right? So the idea is, as we start to classify zones, why do I want IT to come in from their network? And I lost my mic now. Um, I didn't touch anything. There we go. Nope, it's working now. But the idea is that that why would why should they have the ability to do management from outside our zone, which we consider a lower security level, yet they want to do that. So when you start to put this into a threat model, you sit and go, what is the number one prime target and the most attractive in an infrastructure? It's, these, it's the management infrastructure associated with the enterprise. And then you turn around and you ask them, why did you do this? And that's where this whole cost versus convenience comes in. And they all put it in because they want convenience. So let's take convenience to the next piece of this equation. The problem that I've come across a lot, and this is really um, more, it tends to be more in the discrete world, um, where you typically buy and integrate a bunch of kind of packaged systems, like a pharmaceutical plant, it's very common in the packaging side, where you're actually making, you know, you're pelletizing or, or, or creating tablets and then putting them in a package and so on. But what's interesting is all of these machine suppliers turn around and they all want remote access to their equipment. They completely have total disregard for how to implement this securely, yet they also have very specific requirements that they ask for when they sell, right? Because most people want you to support your equipment, and rather than having a full-time guy on site, they all want to do it remotely. So you're right, I think the remote access problem is really causing a lot of harm because again, it's all about convenience. They're choosing to do the easiest thing rather than the most secure. And I do like the comment on trust. In the security world, trust should never be implied or assumed. Trust should always be earned. And trust should be able to be revoked very easily. And that's what's really interesting is we start to distribute these architectures and look at where the true weaknesses are, what the attractive weaknesses are, and what the consequences of those, 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 those targets are. So awesome question. I think secure mode access is, is going to just continue to be big. Um, with NERC SIP, they talk about how you can do that. They talk about limitations of VPN split tunneling, and they give you some advice, and, uh, but it's driven as a business decision. So um, where the trend is going, uh, and even in Sid slides, was um, as, as you put a device into a manufacturing facility and it wakes up and it has one tunnel out to like a well-known address, if you will, the challenges that everybody's having now is what I would call split authentication. So can the local person manage the device and then how does the OEM 
become part of their trust. So it's a, it's a, it's a massive, massive wave. I can tell you want to say something. No, no. No, no, you, I'm just getting ready for more questions. Okay. No, I, I agree with you too. But. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say that, yeah, the challenge is real between... Uh, well, I don't think he has nuclear, but... No, it's, it's between <laughs> the crossover rate, the convenience versus cost, and, and what it means to the customer. The customer is always right, right? Well, unfortunately, you buy what the vendor gives you and what they're willing to provide for you, but at what cost does that come to you as a customer? And I don't want to see this challenge as a one-off on any one customer to be the burden. The vendors need to realize that this is a challenge. This is a well-established remote need, right? Everyone needs to access their systems remotely, and especially in my model, is disconnected. We can have unidirectional gateways, but the data only goes out. The vendor wants to see everything in and may not be able to, to come in to our facilities in four hours. It may take them two days. So we, we have a definite need for a solution in this space, but what we don't want is workarounds. We want a secure three-factor solution or four-factor. We want a sandbox that they can see and not manipulate. So I, I think that's a challenge to the vendors out there. Um, I, I wanted to say something about the lagging and updating infrastructure. That was my, my, my focus area especially, right? Those legacy devices, we need to secure them. We need the focus of the vendors and the community on discrete devices all the way up. And then very lastly, um, BACnet, yeah. It, it's an you know, open protocol, right? And the vendors out there that may want to see all those data points, yeah, they're valuable to you and they may be valuable to us, but let us throttle them and only enable them when you need them. Thanks. Hey, uh, uh, wonderful conversation. This is, okay, I was, I was getting to that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Andy uh, from INO. Um, again, I appreciate the, the talk. Uh, this is gonna be uh, part, uh, uh, it's questions to be part economic, part uh, technical, part psychological. Um, how do you feel? Everybody, I think, Pretty is stressed good. that uh, um, efficiency, uh, we get efficiency and convenience via automation uh, these days. There's other ways, but that's the main, the main topic here. How, how would you respond to the, uh, the, the pithy uh, quote, uh, efficiency fights security? All companies show progress by increasing efficiency. It's how you show you're in motion in business metrics that matter and that you can relate. How do you allow that that's inexorable and yet still make sure the voices and the sentiments of y'all and, and everybody here are, are heavily factored into that mix? Can I, can I add one thing to that? It's just for because I'm not gonna answer the question, but. You know, because I also think the point I tried to make in mind is I find that very true. People who make products who are selling them for a profit are very focused on that issue, obviously, and I'm sure security suffers. But I'm just, I just want to throw into the mix the thing, the fact that many of the infrastructure things have regulations that kind of prevent that in a way, you would hope, or I think they do. They say, well, we want efficient regulations that allow efficiency, but in reality, there's still regulation, so I would think that would constrain it. So I just want to throw that into the pot. If you don't mind, Andy. Well, I'll start this time and we'll come sure. back. So that, that brings up a really good point, and I, and I do, this can become very philosophical and engage in discussions. Because there was a really neat study done by Vodafone in, in Europe, and it, it, it got into just that. Because my answer to that is, is everybody seems to assume that security is being taken care of by someone else. So they tend to not want to take responsibility for themselves and their environment. They assume somebody else is doing it. So look at mobile devices. You ask how many people actually are running security tools on their mobile device. Yet if you look at the, the, the logical assets that are on most of those devices, you know, the, the, there's, there's information that could be devastating if it would ever be compromised. So it was neat with this Vodafone study was they actually took in a building and you know how you go into areas and everybody's supposed to have proper identification and the company policy is, is if people don't have proper identification you're supposed to report them or, or take action. So what they did was they broke it up into three main age groups. Typically the under 30, the 30 to 50, and the over 50. 
Um, now the numbers were slightly different, but the, the idea was pretty much the same. So when they actually collected the data, they found that the people under 30 did absolutely nothing. The person that, the, the, the group that was actually in the 30 to 50 would report the problem, but believe it or not, it was the older generation, the 50 and above, where they actually said, excuse me, you're not supposed to be here, and would physically escort them to a secure area where they could be properly vetted. And that's why I do believe that the one thing that's got to happen is it has to be habits. Habits will change the way we do things, and I don't know what it's going to take. But if you ever watch people click through pop-up screens, you know, somebody will say, can you help me? I had this pop-up screen that told me to do something, and I'm like, really, it told you to do something? Can you tell me what it told you to do? And you kind of watch how people do that rather than stopping and reading, responding, maybe researching before you click the button. So I believe that the biggest change, it is true, I think right now we're, we're becoming complacent and it's going to require habits to change the way we view that stuff. So my comment is um, when you have um, a system and you have a baseline, then you're trying to make it work that way all the time. I mean, that's what security is supposed to do. When you have an actual outage or you have an actual disruption or an event, then everybody wonders where was the security in this? And so uh, to me, security is part of the efficiency of operation. I mean, it, it is what we're supposed to all be doing. Define what the system does, understand what uh, the threat vectors are and how do you mitigate it. And I mean, it's just kind of that. You bet. Yeah, if you look at OEE, man, it's just like how much you're running, what are you running, all that stuff. But yes, so. Yeah, I, I would just say the emotional aspect of it is the fact that nobody wants to be the one that reduces kilowatt hours. Nobody wants to be the one that causes an outage. And as soon as a security product that's implemented does that, guess what? Man, upper management's going to say, take the security product off there. It's taken cycles away from the process automation that should be doing its own job, the baseline that was established. So uh, the biggest challenge that I see from the efficiency factor is, you know, you want to be able to, to build security in versus bolt security on. Anything bolted on is going to introduce that latency and that lag where we have operational systems that have to be running 24-7, run to obsolescence, run to failure. With, within predefined maintenance task windows, we keep that operational. We ensure that it's operating within technical specifications. Anytime that um, we look to, to provide security, we, gotta, we have to factor in what does it mean to the process? And then overall, how can it increase our efficiency versus hinder our efficiency? So I had two, two thoughts on your question. One was that there is an implied moving to digital and more and more digital maybe kind of is a way to get to efficiency. And that if that's not secure, then that's, that's not a good thing, right? But so I think the, the fundamental thing is that how do you measure the value of security? And I think we somehow have to come up with sort of dual mode use cases where you have to tie it to a return on investment somehow. I, I think in our space, I think I'm not exactly sure of this. I've heard this from all the people I talk to. We lose track of inventory. We're not exactly sure what's in our our substations are in different places. I'm sure in the nuclear world, they probably never lose anything for sure. There's no way, but, but you know, I guess in distribution, we're a little bit, uh, uh, but so uh, there's tremendous in value in knowing what your assets that you do have. So if you can do a security plan where you come in and you inspect or you visualize or you watch the network traffic in that one substation, and from that you get an inventory, maybe there's an ROI there immediately. You know? So if there's some way you can say by, by improving efficiency, I'm also looking for return on investment on security. Maybe we could think that way a little bit more. This is a good question, so I'm glad we're going to kind of maybe do another round. Because one thing that, I, that it was, was a good case study for that was what I observed when I was doing some work with a couple major pharmaceutical companies. Because again, there was nothing in, 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 in the cyber landscape that would ever cause them to fail a federal audit because that audit's all around proper documentation, change control, and the whole ability to consistently and repeatedly produce the exact same product that meets certain standards. So 
they were, they were, internally they were stalling out on how to fund a cyber program. Because in the end, the cyber program, it took about five years to fully fund and it was massive. Because the quick way we turned was immediately went to looking at efficiencies of their factories. And what we found was because of poor cyber hygiene, they actually, their plant uptime was significantly impacted. And as you would expect, you could geographically align the, the, the poor performing plants with very, very, very high risk countries around the world. And that was one thing that really, because it's kind of with the ROI. The ROI from the cyber point of view really had nothing to do with security. It had to do with plant performance and efficiency, right? So the better it runs, the more efficient it runs, the lower the cost of the goods manufactured and so on. So it really did balance out when we looked at it. And again, the ability to kind of change the approach based on the individual situation. Let's go to the next question. Okay. Um, so uh, I am uh, Eddie Lee with Moxa, and I have a question for you that's um, maybe from a slightly different perspective. Uh, this is more directed to Jeff and Joel, perhaps, but anyone on the panel certainly is, is welcome to chime in. From a, more from a device or equipment supplier perspective, as we you know, try to address cybersecurity, um, you know, obviously different end customers from different industries, or even within the same industry, have completely varying expectations, right, in terms of what they're trying to accomplish. So for a lot of suppliers, one of the things that uh, you, know, you might see happening is the adoption of, for example, the IEC 62443, um, perhaps a little more traction there than the NIST framework, just because it's positioned as a global standard, right, as compared to having to worry about in North America, you've got NIST, and what do you do for Asia market versus Germany or, or Russia, as an example. So low-hanging fruit says, hey, let's take a hard look at 62443. Since both of you gentlemen mentioned that in your, you know, um, in your presentations, I'm curious what you think of the value of IEC 62443 today in, in terms of, yeah, it, it's, its helpfulness and also just its positioning, perhaps, as um, a, a starting point for a lot of different vendors in the marketplace. Yeah, so uh, 62443 I think is wonderful from a perspective is it's making the vendors come to the table. And literally when they do systems and they describe it, they talk about what their product does at a very fundamental level. Then they say, um, what are the security features that we as end implementers or system integrators or whatever can use? And, and more importantly, what are the things it's missing? So what are the things it's not going to do for you? Um, the other part of the vendor equation is they are now forced to do uh, secure life cycle development. So they have to say, um, all the way through uh, like the interfaces to these devices, what, you know, what are the vulnerabilities of just low level calls? So it's forcing them to actually think of not just getting a product done, but actually get it done securely. So, so A, I'll start off. I, I absolutely am, I, I am very much behind 6443. I'm a voting member, been involved with it for about eight years now. The one thing that's probably the most frustrating aspect of 62443 is I'm not seeing the global adaptation of it. There's a lot of dynamics going on right now in the cyberspace. So let's take a look at you know, the, 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 the four family of 62443, which tends to be the component level aspects of the standard. Then you go to a country like France, and France has decided that they're gonna issue their own guidance. And there's actually been talk, and hopefully this will never pass, that in order for high-risk products to be deployed in critical infrastructure across multiple sectors, right, including things like banking and so on, they have to be certified by a French agency. Now, that's going the wrong way, I think, right? So they're going to create their own. But if you go look at what they're doing in Germany, same basic idea. BSI has their approach to doing things, so they create their methodology because they think it's the best. And you know you do, you, step, you keep stepping around. Japan's got their own set of requirements. A lot of people will tend to assume one or the other. That's the biggest challenge I see for the 62443 acceptance. A, we've got to get all the pieces done and approved. So right now, I mean, it, it, and, and the committees are pushing very hard to get them all done. Because up until a couple years ago, the, the, the suite, though it showed all the numbers, they weren't all done. That's 
I mean, the key components are just starting to get out. Like we just voted last week, uh, the end of the month, um, was the, the final tally on 2-4, which is the requirements that I think are key. Those are the requirements around the people that put everything together. So we've got the vendor level at four, and then three is the control catalog, and two tends to be more systems. So as soon as we get it done, it's great, but now we've got to get people to adopt it. And one last comment on there. The thing that probably disappoints me the most about the adaptation of the standard is the lack of people's understanding of the whole zone conduit model. I think that the authors of that, and I know Eric Cosman, who he had flight problems like me because we were in the same part of the country. He's one of the original founders and leads of that committee. The idea behind zoning, zones and conduits is so fundamentally unique to OT. It's hard to convince an IT-led security program of why we want to do it. And I know Jeff mentioned it earlier. One of the most beautiful concepts of that framework is if you take a bunch of items, actually Nathan said it, is if you take a bunch of items that represent relatively the same security profile, you may not be able to secure those devices, whether they're embedded, whether they're legacy, but what you can do is you can put them in a zone and you can secure the conduits in and out of that zone. And that's a concept that is so powerful, yet when you try to get people to design around that idea, they all want to design an architecture around the Purdue model. The Purdue model is not a security architecture. So that's where I'm hoping that we'll see a trend as people start to grasp this concept of what is a security zone and then the ability to create those zones. Sorry, that was a little long-winded. I've never been short before. So sorry. <laughs> I think I'm depressed now, though, because, you know, all my life I've never seen any global standard win, you know, and even for plugs in the wall, they're different in, in countries, although there's been pretty good consolidation. So does that mean, my question to you would be, does that mean that we really just need a market leader, an Apple or an Android, you know, to win? So Google should just buy all our vendors up. Put that, you know? <laughs> Could I ask a question? I want to follow up on that. Um, you know, whenever I see the IEC 62443, and I, I'm not intimately involved in the standards group or anything, but when I first saw it, it was the earlier stuff, the stuff that has been approved, it was very nice, I used the term use case, you know, it looked at a plant and says, this is how you should structure it. It threw in some SCADA stuff and said, okay, do this. But, I mean, I, and I get the point about the conduits and secure, the, the conduit concept, I, and I agree completely. But I'm just wondering, because is it generic enough? I mean, I hear people saying, oh, we're IEC 62443 compliant, which to me means nothing, okay? <laughs> but but not that I'm against the standard by any means, it's just it, it's not that rigid that it tells you that much. It has some basic principles. But what I was going to ask is, the way you just mentioned with the zones and conduits, is there enough there to cover all of these issues? Like at the very beginning when I made the comment there about acronyms, it's, I was joking, but in the sense that there's so many different standards for different reasons. And I understand sta regulations. It, regulations, I'll use that term. But even standards, as you just mentioned, everybody's got different standards. But is it because there is are things that are not being addressed that are unique to different industries? Or is it something just because they want to do it? Or uh, it, my sense is, is IEC 62443, do you think it's broad enough to serve all of the industries? Maybe their compliance is the only thing needed. You know I mean? Like you have compliance. I mean, we all know nuclear, <laughs> but. Unique. Unique, it's yeah. Unique. unique, yes. So the one challenge that I see is that, and, and you get into these debates, is that security implemented in the absence of a good risk management framework will never lead to security. So the idea here, and this is where, this is why some of these standards I don't like, because all they are is a list of everything you need to do. The whole idea around security is to reduce risk. So you need to target your deployment at reducing your risk not my risk, not a peer company's risk, but your risk. That's what 62443, when it was still a 99 numbering sequence, had that was unique. It was the only standard of its kind that had that aspect. And the most disappointing thing that happened with the 2-1 rewrite is they pulled it out and they put it as an, as an annex to that document. It was a core concept of the idea of around risk 
before you deploy security. And what happened is, is there was such a drive by the community to make 62443-2-1 look so 27001-like that they lost sight of it. And that's really what I get, you know, you get a little disappointed because the one thing that, that, that I always, and I always ask people when I engage in consulting and, and engagements, is how many people have actually read the document? So I'll sit in meetings with industrial security programs where people will come in and they've never looked at the document. It's the only one of its kind. But this idea around risk identification, right? You read the 27,000s in a standard information security approach always classifies risk in terms of its impact to CINA. 62443 never took that approach. It actually represented it using a security level term and then based it on the extent of the resources required to compromise, the capabilities necessary, and the impact on your organization, right? So they kept away from trying to do a CIA because we all know it's AIC in the OT world and created this neat modeling system that now is based on something more qualitative in nature but more directly applicable to a system that is doing a task rather than moving records from point A to point B. Okay, sorry. So um, the thing I like about 62443, one minute, okay. No, no, one question. One, oh, sorry. No, 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 we, we, we're running out of time. It's lunchtime right now, so um, hurry up with that thought and we so, gotta close. Uh, I got just quick comment is you can't identify risk if you don't know what the threat vectors, actors, whatever you want to call it. So 6443 forces the vendors to look at all the stacks and say, oh my gosh, here, here's our risk. So it makes them identify it. Uh, the security levels that um, you mentioned are amazing because if you actually read the document like he's suggesting, it goes through and you want to marry that to the dash one document that has common terms. So it, it's actually very usable if you read it. The end. <laughs> All right, well.